Good evening. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone here on behalf of the New School. My name is Michael Cohen. I'm the director of the Graduate Program in International Affairs. And as you know, uh, we're going to have a, an important subject discussion about some international subjects tonight. Um, you're coming into a university and into a room where there have been a lot of hot debates for many years on, on important international, international themes. The university with a long tradition of discussion and debate. And we're delighted that this evening we can host uh, an event uh, sponsored by the Nation and Nation, the Nation Institute and Nation Books uh, on the Goldstone Report. So I'm going to turn this over to Andrew Breslaw from the Nation Institute. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, in the spring of 2009, South African Judge Richard Goldstone set out on a mission to the Gaza Strip on assignment from the United Nations Human Rights Council to investigate possible war crimes committed by both Israel and Hamas during Operation Cast Lead, Israel's invasion of Gaza a few months earlier. Many other reports on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict have been conducted, but the account Goldstone's mission produced later that year became the report heard around the world, as it alleged that both Israel and Hamas committed atrocities during the 2009 incursion into Gaza. With Israel, quote, from the report, aiming to punish, humiliate, and terrorize the civilian population. This characterization incited an uproar in Israel and abroad. Nation Books recently published the Goldstone Report, along with additional analysis, commentary, and a context for a new debate with regards to the report's importance. I want to acknowledge uh, the editors of that report, uh, Phil Weiss, Adam Horowitz, and Lizzie Ratner. Uh, tonight, with our partners at the New School, we're delighted to present what will no doubt be an engaging conversation on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the report's findings, and how the ramifications of the changing landscape in Egypt, Libya, and elsewhere in the region impact the elusive search for peace in the Middle East. After about an hour of conversation among our panel, we'll be getting into a number of questions from you, our audience, that we'll gather um, from you. Uh, as you arrived, you hopefully were given an index card on which questions can be written. Uh, our volunteers will begin collecting questions from you about 40 minutes from now. Uh, a couple pieces of housekeeping um, is that both the Goldstone Report and books by our panelists are available for sale in the lobby. We encourage you to spend and support the work of these uh, important voices in public discourse. And please make sure that your cell phones are silenced. Uh, it is now my uh, great pleasure to introduce our moderator, uh, for this evening, Roger Cohen. Uh, Roger joined the New York Times in 1990. He was a foreign correspondent for more than a decade before becoming the acting uh, foreign editor on September 11, 2001, and foreign editor six, month later, six months later. Since 2004, he's written a column for the International Herald Tribune, and in 2009, he was named a columnist for the New York Times. Among other titles, Mr. Cohen has written Hearts Grown Brutal, Sagas, Sagas of Sarajevo, An Account of Wars of Yugoslavia's Destruction, and Soldiers and Slaves, American POWs Trapped by the Nazis' Final Gamble. Roger. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Andy. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm just back from uh, Tunisia and Egypt, um, which uh, I have to say, even after 30 years now in journalism were some of the most uh, moving and uplifting events that I've had the privilege uh, to witness. And it was notable to me that um, three words that I did not hear in Tahrir Square uh, were Israel, um, Islam, and Iran. Uh, these are, in my view, um, Arab um, uprisings for freedom, uh, and to establish institutions, uh, their dignity and the rule of law. It's about Arabs doing things for Arabs. Uh, it is not, at this point anyway, um, about Israel. But of course, uh, there's probably nothing that could be more polarizing uh, in the region than if another conflict erupted. And as long as uh, there is no resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, that is always a possibility. Now, Israel has tended so far at least, to view these changes with some 
skepticism. Uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has compared events in Egypt uh, to events in 1979 in Iran, saying that, um, watch out, you know, things could go that way. And it's a little bit um, the kind of siege mentality that some people saw in the response uh, to the Goldstone Report, uh, seeing it as uh, a frontal attack on Israel and not as a dispassionate uh, report. So I think one of the issues we want to try to explore tonight is, is, is just that. Are we seeing an Israeli siege mentality that is missing the opportunities that are now arising in the wider uh, Middle East? And uh, we have two very distinguished uh, panelists uh, with us tonight who need very little introduction. Uh, Congressman uh, Anthony Weiner uh, was born and raised uh, in Brooklyn. Uh, after graduation, he went to work for Congressman Charles Schumer. He was one of the youngest people, if not the youngest, ever elected to New York City Council. And for a dozen years now, more than a dozen years, he has uh, been a congressman uh, in Washington, currently serving on the Energy and Commerce uh, Committee. Uh, he's been described by the Daily News as one of the leaders of the 21st century. Forward called him one of the 50 most influential Jewish Americans. He has been a vigorous uh, defender of Israel, uh, both with respect <coughs> to uh, the Gaza incursion and uh, the flotilla incident in which Israel killed nine people on board the Mavi Marmara, including one uh, U.S. citizen. Uh, Brian Baird is former U.S. representative for Washington's third congressional district. He served from 1999 until 2011. Um, he is a clinical psychologist and the former chairman of the Department of Psychology at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, he went to Gaza as a congressman very soon after Israel's um, operation cast lead and uh, was pretty overwhelmed by what he saw there. And I'd like to start, um, Dr. Baird, um, by asking you, um, you know, you were one of the very few congressmen who'd actually been in Gaza. Uh, you'd seen uh, what happened on the ground. And in the light of what you saw, how did you find what the Goldstone Report said corresponded to what you've seen? Did it seem to you an accurate reflection or a gross distortion? First of all, Roger, thanks. Uh, and thanks to the New School for hosting this. And Tony, great to see you again. You as well. Tony and I are classmates and friends and uh, compatriots in many ways. Uh, and teammates. And teammates, more importantly, on baseball. Uh, uh, there was a picture in the New York Times, and, and it, I think it was an AP photo, of three uh, small Palestinian children who were laying on a rug. And they were probably somewhere between the ages of two and four. And they, they had that sort of angelic look that children have when they're sleeping. And yet, if you looked at the picture, uh, next to those three children was uh, their father, and he was on his knees, and he was holding his head and undoubtedly gr crying in, in ag agonizing grief. Those children were about the same age of my kids at the time. And I felt that it was important uh, to go and see what had happened there. So Keith Ellison and I, Keith is a, a Democrat from Minnesota, went, and separately from us, John Kerry went at, at the same time. And the idea was to go and see what had actually happened with our own eyes. And having seen it, and we spent two days there, and then I went three other times, so I've been four times, which as far as I know, more than any other American official to date, there are volunteer relief workers there, but I think I've been more than anybody else. Uh, so when Goldstone came out, I read it with great care and attention because there was a lot of criticism of it. And you I, read the whole report? The whole thing, front to back. Uh, and I kept waiting for that moment where I would say, oh, I see why they're criticizing Goldstone. He's vastly off the mark. That moment never came. Uh, it was, the, the report in Goldstone was consistent with what we had seen 
personally with our own eyes. It was consistent with the reports of the individuals we had spoken with. Keith and I also visited Starote on a couple of occasions and elsewhere in the region. And I found Goldstone uh, 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 a very accurate portrayal, sadly, of what uh, I had seen in the, in the region and what people, eyewitness accounts, both American relief teams, UNRWA people, uh, Palestinians themselves, mental, med uh, medical professionals, healthcare professionals. What had you seen, Dr. Baird? What had you seen on the ground? Uh, Al Quds Hospital. If you could just quickly yeah, summarize. Very quickly. Al Quds Hospital had yeah. been burned, hit by a phosphorus bomb. The UN headquarters had been hit by phosphorus bombs. U.S. Uh, a courageous former military guy had helped save the entire region because of phosphorus bomb and landed right near a, a, a fuel depot. Uh, the American uh, International School had been absolutely uh, leveled, and an entire industrial zone, uh, in some cases the factories owned by American graduates from American schools, had been absolutely leveled. Much of that after, uh, by consistent reports, after the, or after the area was secured. So the IDF went in and wiped out industrial capacity and civilian infrastructure after an area was secured. You'd been there, so presumably you had something interesting to say. Did any Members of Congress come up to you and say, gee, Brian, uh, is, what did you see? Uh, you know, we've got we've to debate this. Um, uh, can you tell us to inform our debate what you saw? Because I've got to make a decision about this report, and I'd like to know what you saw on the ground. Did anyone, was anyone curious about what you'd seen on the Hill? No. <laughs> uh, as, as, as troubling as what we saw in Gaza had been, it was perhaps even more troubling that the resolution came to the floor. By the way, Judge Goldstone was right here in New York at the time and offered <coughs> to come talk to members of Congress. He said, I will testify, I'll come down for a hearing. No one ever invited him. We finally got him, he came after the resolution came up. Not a single person who voted on that resolution came to myself, maybe some talked to Keith, I don't know, but said, you've been there, you've read the report, what did you see? Member of Congress after member of Congress after member of Congress went down and passionately spoke about a report they had never read in a place they had never been without ever asking those of us who'd read the report or been there what we thought of it. Congressman Weiner, um, you were uh, one of those people uh, in Congress who, who worked hard uh, to get a resolution passed, which I think passed by 344 to 36 votes, which described the report as, quote, irredeemably biased and unworthy of further consideration or legitimacy. What, what convinced you personally that this report was so fundamentally flawed? Well, before I answer that, let me express my admiration and thanks for Brian for being here and for his service in Congress. He and I are, are friends. He, as he said in passing, he and I are on the Democratic Congressional Baseball team together and we, uh, and I, ironically, interestingly, or just saddeningly for me, he had his best year ever last year and was just hitting the ball a ton. And he's, he's a great friend, and I'm someone who, when we got elected in 1998, it was the first time that Democrats had actually gained seats in a second term, midterm, when their party was in power. And if you got to think about it, that was Clinton's second term. We actually defied the trend, and, and we, we added to the Democratic majority, and having Brian not there is a great loss. Let me just, just say this. In, in many ways, the, the problem with the report grew out of where it came from. The, the United Nations Human Rights Council has been an irredeemably anti-Israel organism ever since it was created. Of the 34 actions it's taken, 26 were directed at Israel. None directed at Rwanda. It was, this was a, a report that was, came out of a complaint lodged by Libya, a famous member of its council, and Cuba, it's also an, a, a, an, organ, an, an organization that, that created a resolution that was asked, and I'm going to quote from it just, and I won't quote much from things today, but this is what kind of like the whereas clause leads up to what it declares, and it says, this decides to er dispatch an urgent, independent, international fact-finding mission to be appointed by the President to the Council to investigate all violations of international human rights law and international humanitarian law by the occupying power Israel against the Palestinian people throughout the occupied Palestinian territory, particularly in the occupied Gaza Strip, due to the current aggression, and calls upon Israel not to obstruct the process and to fully cooperate with the mission. But Justice now, Goldstein... Let me, let me, yeah. let me, let me, let me finish, yeah. finish my answer. Okay. Now, Mr. Goldstein said, well, I'm going to disregard that but it was never formally changed by the United Nations. 
And in many ways, your question to Brian, I think, touches on the very flaw of, that this discussion has had up to now. There's no dispute that there was destruction. It was a war. The Goldstone Report speaks to the intentions of Israel and the intentions of Hamas in an entirely distorted way. There is no way possible that with all of Brian's observations that we can understand whether or not those phosphorus bombs were used to do great harm or they were used to, to jam up heat-seeking um, heat devices, the same way our military used them. There is no saying that, uh, that something was done in self-defense. In fact, the Goldstone Report barely uses the language of self-defense. Yet when it came to judging what Hamas was doing, it was entirely, almost entirely virtuous in the eyes of the report, and the 12,000 rocket re rockets that landed in Israel were somehow considered a, an appropriate part of its, of its uh, defense of its lands. And when Israel acted, its intentions, despite the, the explanations of Israel, were all considered sinister. It's completely unbalanced. The issue is not whether there was terrible things happened. Whenever you have armaments being exchanged, that means an international law and dialogue and, con and, con and, and conversation has broken down. Diplomacy has failed. When you have war, then you've got to start looking at things in a different way. You've got to start saying, you've got to start saying, what are the, what, what is a correct way to, uh, to, to begin this investigation? It started out an incorrect way, and frankly, the product bore out the concern that it was going to be a biased report. A former IDF officer described the Gaza operation as an eye for an eyelash, and an eye for an eyelash, and the ratio of dead was roughly of the order of 100 Palestinian dead per one Israeli dead, um, about 1,400 Palestinians to about 13 Israelis. Did that trouble you at all? Well, look, I, I'm troubled that anyone died. I'm troubled that there are any bombs, any missiles that fell on Sterot, let alone 10,000, 10,000 of them, and there are 12,000 and they're still counting. Of course. But the point is, when you're going to examine this, you can't look at it entirely through the lens of whether or not there was destruction. It was a war, and war is a bad and destructive and dangerous and deadly thing. And the idea that, that, that when you're dealing with a war, that, that both party, both places are fairly small, but Gaza is a small place. Like, there are plenty of investigations that have been done that people can refer to to get the explanation. And, and I have to tell you something. Unlike other countries in that region, Israel is an open democracy. They investigate themselves, and, I, and here's what they do. Listen, I have to tell you something. You're, first of all, I just, as, yeah, a, as this is a point of privilege, I convened 41 Tea Party health care town hall meetings, so yelling at me really doesn't have the effect it has on some. So, <laughs> but the point that I'm making is that, that the Israelis investigated. They found some serious things were done, not nearly what Goldstone found, and that investigation should be lauded, and I don't believe the Goldstone report should be. If right. they found some serious things that went wrong, why was their reaction to Goldstone so outraged? I, actually, I, I was wondering uh, how many, to Brian's point, how many, how many members of Congress do you think actually read the report or took any interest in what was in it? I'm, I'm, I'm not, not well, have two, well those, those are two, two different things. I mean, well, read it, okay, you know, read it. There are probably it. most members of Congress, you know, this whole read the bill thing, I've heard that before too. You know, they, they are, they are, there are many members, I'm sure, who have not read the U.S. Code. That doesn't mean that they can't have an informed discussion about it. I, I, I don't know, you know, the, 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 the Goldstone Report, for those who haven't read it, and, and, and I have, in many cases, is a litany, one after another, of descriptions of terrible destruction. And the question is the intention. The intention in this exchange, if you were to understand and believe the Goldstone Report, the intention of the Israelis was not to defend itself. The, the word self-defense appear three times. It was to for, p p put some form of collective punishment on the people of Gaza. In order to draw that conclusion, you've got to ignore what the Israelis say and ignore the history that led up to it. That's the issue. The Goldstone Report, litany of, of bad things, and, and Brian saw some of them, and, and God bless that, that the people there. That's not the issue. The issue is, was this war? And the answer is it was. Dr. Right, Baird, what's your, yeah, and, and address please this issue of collective punishment. Let me address just a couple of things. One of the frustrations about the debate was the mischaracterization both of what happened on the ground in Gaza and of what was actually in the report. And 
the for, report actually, contrary to what Anthony r describes, the report was actually very clear in condemning the ha Hamas rocketing of Starod. It's absolutely clear about it. It doesn't give it short shrift. It's absolutely clear. It su suggests it may well constitute a war crime and may constitute a crime against humanity. I mean, that's, you can find it in the report if you read the report. So to say it bypasses this is, is just a mischaracterization. I would, I would just urge people, you know, this is a, a remarkable book, and, and, and the, re the report was remarkable. Just start it. If you get a chance, don't read the whole thing. If you, I mean, read the whole thing. It's worth it. But 80, page 87, 139. It was not just that Goldstone just willy-nilly said, oh, gee, what about the white phosphorus on UNRWA? That's just a bad thing. They must have been targeting UNRWA. Quite the contrary. Goldstone report walks through the Israeli arguments. And it's quite telling because there's this sequence of events that basically says the Israelis initially essentially deny that anything was hit, then deny that it was intentional, and there's a modification over time. But Goldstone walks through the objective evidence. And I talked to US, former US military who were there when they got shelled. By the way, you should be uh, aware that the, the, the phosphorus bombs were from the Redstone Arsenal in the United States of America. These were US weaponry multiple direct hits on the UNRWA compound. This was not, you know, an errant, an errant shot. These were multiple direct hits with fairly well-targeted munitions on the UNRWA compound. And that was true elsewhere. I mean, there's no plausibility that, that the American International School was an accidental shot. And so, yes, if you're talking about crimes, you have to talk about intention. You have to talk about intention. And I will tell you that I think in, in the case of the unshelling and many others, there was clear intention. Secondly, about collective punishment. So Keith Ellison and I went to the, some fairly high Israelis and asked, why did you destroy the industrial zone after it was secure? Why do that? Strategically, why do that? Mind you, I'd, I'd spent a, a fair bit of time in Iraq and Afghanistan. Spent a lot of time talking to General Petraeus and the counterinsurgency folks. How is the destruction of civilian economic capacity going to win you friends? The answer was intriguing. The answer was, Congressman, this is Hamastan. As if to imply that whatever we did there is justifiable because Hamas is in charge. Well, Goldstone raises the legal and justifiable question and I think eloquently so, and concludes that it is not just under international law, and I agree with that conclusion. But there's also a really important strategic question of is it smart to do that, and I think it is not smart. Did just. you come away feeling that U.S. foreign policy in this region is smart? Uh, no, I, 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 I did not, uh, not only from that trip, but from many others. And, and, and what there, do you think's wrong with it? United States, when we are at our best, are a beacon for the world when we're at our best. And we can be at our best. And we have not gotten enough credit for it. And one of the things that, you know, uh, this tragic killing of two U.S. Uh, soldiers in Germany, for God's sakes, by a Kosovar, the U.S. stopped a genocide against Muslims in Kosovo. We did much the same as you know far better than me, Roger, with your work in Bosnia. And we don't get enough credit for a lot of the good we do. Uh, but when we... I mean, the language of the congressional resolution was telling. Oppose any further consideration, consideration, by the way, we are sort of in violation of a congressional uh, uh, resolution here because we're considering a resolution. If somebody's here from an international country, we now constitute a multilateral fora. We, 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 well, that's you, Roger. So, so, so we are now in violation of a congressional resolution. I mean, seriously, we not only said we disagree with it, we had no hearings, by the way. <laughs> we had no hearings. We didn't let Judge, so much for habeas corpus, Judge Goldstone couldn't defend himself. But the Congress said, no, we're going to block anybody even considering this. How can we then tell the world we stand for rule of law and justice and objective empirical evidence and all the things we, we ought to say? So how did the New School get permission for tonight? Right, they, they're in violation of a congressional resolution, and they'll, they'll, they'll be under arrest very shortly. <laughs> um, Congressman Weiner, uh, Peter Beinart last year um, wrote a much discussed piece um, which identified a growing disenchantment with Israel among young liberal American Jews. And he said they were bulking at checking their liberalism at Zionism's door. 
I'm wondering if that's what you, um, yourself, and other congressmen like Barney Frank sometimes feel obliged to do. I mean, you're liberal across the board here, um, choice, health care, etc., standing up for human rights, justice, rule of law, freedom of movement, and so on, everywhere in the world, um, except when it seems that it's Israel that's <laughs> impinging on these things. Uh, this is, um, uh, that you're, are you moderating this debate, or are you, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, honestly. <laughs> Well, let me just. No, uh, I'm, I know. Listen, listen. I'm two, uh, Peter by, by the way, by the way, two on one. I still think you guys are outnumbered. Listen, <laughs> I, I look here. Here's here's my view. First of all, I I don't want to I don't want to leave leave t t t too quickly this important point, which has not been addressed by Brian or by you, and that is the distinction between having damage done in an act of war and the intent of it the intent of it. It's important. When you see that the Israelis, and I just checked my notes, made 165,000 uh, phone calls to Gazans telling them when the bombing was going to happen and where. When it sent 2.5 million warning notes were dropped in the territory to, to let people know where to stay away from. When 300,000 leaflets were distributed in, in, in Gaza City alone to tell people, look, this is what's happening. When every single time there was a response to those 12,000 rockets, the Israelis warned in advance what they were going to do and said, the, the simple question becomes not whether or not it, the, these things happen. Just to repeat, that there has been no, nothing introduced here, nor in Goldstone, that says the Israelis, did, their intentions were any more sinister than the Gazans. And when, and when, and when Brian points to the idea that they, that they said that war crimes might have been committed by Hamas in all of this bombing, the difference is, and it's an important one, when the report summarizes the motivations of the two sides is where the bias is most acute because it says the motivation of Israel is always accepted to be the most sinister, this collective prosecution, and the Gazans is always considered to be the most benign, meaning they're defending themselves in their right to self-determination. But it accuses but both let me sides just, but, of crimes but, against but let me, Both sides Oh, no, no, but, but the question is yeah. not whether or not it didn't mention the Gazan, the, 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 uh, that Hamas was bombing Israel. It's whether or not it attributed the motivation to Israel as more sinister than that of Gaza, not accepting for a moment the idea of self-defense is a legitimate reason why countries go to war with other countries. That's the thing. They are a sovereign. There's a sovereign. Gaza is now sovereign. Do you accept the idea that self-defense, Congressman, can become grossly disproportionate? I, I do. Here's, do what I, here's, what, here's what I will say. I will say that whether or not gross disproportionate, it is not something not, not subject to the rules of international law. It's subject to the rules of war. And the Geneva Convention was followed scrupulously. And I didn't see anywhere in the allegations that, the, that even the, the rules of war were even considered for this report, because quite, quite the opposite. Goldstone said, we're looking at this through the laws of justice. Unfortunately, and this pains me to say, when you're at war, it's because the laws have broken down. But let me take your question, because it's, one of the re it's, it's frankly the reason I'm here. There is no doubt about it that we have a problem, we being progressives, have a problem that large numbers of us have come to turn the story of David and Goliath as it relates to Israel on its head and have lost sight of the fact that Israel is the democracy in the Middle East, in that region, which is at war with 20 of her neighbors. Not that she declared war with them, the 20 neighbors declared war with her. She is the one with the judiciary. She is the one that has, puts out reports like this that are critical of its own, of its, of its own military. We seem to forget that it is the progressive position to have, and it always has been, to support countries that try to do what Israel is doing in that part of the world. Gaza, uh, Hamas, Hezbollah, they are not. Hezbollah is at war with the Palestinian Authority, with Fatah, at this moment. The, 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 um, the, the uh, embargo that has been set up by Israel is also set up by Egypt. By the way, I didn't see that mentioned in the Goldstone Report. Egypt also has an embargo against Gaza because Gaza is exporting terrorism to Egypt. 
So this whole idea that the that and this is why I, I eagerly accepted the invitation to come here to this to this icon of progressive thought here in, in, in the village is that we have to start pushing back on the notion that it is somehow anathema to progressive thought to support a democracy in the Middle East. That is Israel, and I'm proud to be a progressive who believes that. We I think I think we all uh, I think I think Congressman we all we all appreciate your decision to come here tonight. Thank you for that. Um, nevertheless, I think they're I'd also clapping for the things I said, but I'll, I'll let your, your <laughs> um, Nevertheless, I'd like to ask you if um, there's anything that Israel has done in recent years, whether Gaza, the flotilla incident, the daily difficulties, humiliations, Palestinians in, in the West Bank, which which troubles your conscience in any way? Well, what le as 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 a Jew, I, I think that as uh, virtually all Israelis would agree, and, and, and no no one go ahead. So no, I, I mean clearly Israel's image in the world um, has suffered in recent yeah. years, and I'm wondering why you think that is, and whether you see. Any reason for that that might be linked well, to Gaza or well, this anything is, else? Well, this is one reason. I mean, this is one reason. You have biased reports like this. The United Nations continually seeing its human rights efforts directed at not at Rwanda, but continually at Israel over and over again is one of the reasons. But let me get to your first point is this. Look, the Israelis don't want to occupy anybody. They left Gaza. Gaza, Gaza is not... Gaza... Is, here's a statement of fact. Well, it's 43 Here, years the, in the West you know, Bank. Listen, I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to ask yeah. if you're going to moderate. I know you're not moderating at this point, no, but I, I, I need you to, to let me answer, answer yeah. the question. Yeah. Gaza, to this moment, and since 2005, has not been occupied by anyone. There's not a single Israeli soldier in Gaza today. So many people. I'm going to tell you something. I bet you there. I bet you there. Please, I bet you there I, I are many. Ask, I must there, ask the audience. There please, are probably, please respect the. There please. Are, please can I just, as moderator, sure. Can, sure. can I say something? Please, I know there are some strong feelings here tonight. This is a conflict that arouses great passions. But I think in the interests of the debate, and it's always good to debate things and exchange ideas, um, if you could wait to put your questions at the end of, I'll try and leave plenty of time for you all to put questions. I think, thank right. you. Right, let me, let me just, yeah. the, the point that I, that I was making is that there are many people who probably believe from this debate that Gaza is still occupied to this day. Israel, Israel wants, I can tell you, and I've never heard anyone in, in Israeli government say anything different, wants to end and have a peaceful two-state, I can't say no one in, 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 in the government doesn't want a two-state solution, but it's the accepted position of the government. They are, however, a country that has on the north a Hezbollah-dominated Lebanese, Lebanon government, and in the south, at least part of the, the Palestinian territories are controlled by a terrorist organization, the other side is, is part is, is part of day-to-day -day negotiations that hopefully can get restarted. So yes, nobody wants the status quo stasis, but that is a straw man. The question is, how do we leave this place and get to a better place? The Goldstone Report didn't get us any closer to that. Peter, oh, to bed. Uh, or Roger, yeah. the, the um, just a few things. First, it is seems to be virtually unknown in the Congress. Tony does know it that the entire Arab League has endorsed the Arab Peace Initiative. This idea that Israel is surrounded by people who are utterly sworn to their complete and total elimination is old news, and it's not accurate. Uh, there are terms and conditions by which the Arab Peace Initiative would be realized, and in addition, almost all members of the Islamic League have endorsed the Arab Peace Initiative. So, so it's this idea that Israel is surrounded by countries intent on driving it into the sea is just not accurate. There is indeed the possibility and indeed a, a, I think a, a reasoned approach that could lead us to peace. Now let's look a little bit about this issue of attitude and collective punishment of the Palestinians and especially in Gaza but it's also true in the West Bank and it's true even within Israel with Palestinians. I happen by coincidence. I think most progressives love the idea of a democracy. And they admire Israel for many of its democratic qualities. But it is, an, it is an unequal democracy by almost any standard if people know what's actually happening on the ground. I happened to be in the Knesset on a day 
when on first reading they passed a resolution saying it was a criminal offense to suggest in public that Israel shouldn't be considered a Jewish state. A criminal offense. Just to say it. So much for First Amendment, so much for separation of church and state, all the things that we value as progressives. Uh, you can't even say it or you go to jail. Uh, after the vote, uh, after the vote, Netanyahu came to the room and, and Ehud Barak. They were not there to speak against it, to say this is crazy. This isn't the society that we've envisioned where people go to jail for just raising a, a thought. If Israel is really as benign in its intent, how does one understand that we have to have the Secretary of State of the United States of America and the Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee pleading with our major foreign aid recipient for many years to allow lentils in? How is that? How is it that we are, that Israel, and, and if you say Gaza is not occupied, how is it they can't get toothpaste and tomato paste? And how is it that almost every week I get a note from people I'm aware of in Gaza who tell about another child who's gathering pebbles 300 meters from the wall and gets shot by sharpshooters? 13-year-old kids out there in their shorts running around picking up rocks because Israel won't let any aggregate in to repair schools and hospitals and homes. So these kids ground through the old rubble, find little rocks, and some sharpshooter pops off at them and shoots them and sometimes kills them, wounds them gravely. How is it that thousands of Palestinians, thousands, are being held in detention in sometimes pretty rugged conditions, to say the least? And I've met with some of these folks with no trial, with no representation. How is it that children are taken from their homes in the middle of the night, dragged into custody, threatened, beaten, given no representation, told to sign confessions written in Hebrew. How's this the democracy? You betcha progressives have a right to call for a higher standard. I'm a progressive and proud of it. And I'm a proud supporter of Israel. But I think, Anthony, that in many respects, this country that I care and respect a great deal about is losing its way. And I think Goldstone has an opportunity to say, look, folks, there are some folks who are doing some things that are not consistent with your higher virtues. And yes, it is a time of war. And yes, it's a horrible thing, an inexcusable thing, and a war crime that people have rocketed us to rope. But the proportionality is not there. And the ongoing day-to-day, today-to-day, today-to-day indignities. In East Jerusalem, there's a hospital called Augusta Victoria. It's a leading Palestinian cancer hospital. Children who are there from Gaza can't be accompanied by their parents in many cases. Tony, I got twin six-year-old boys. They're about to turn six. If my child's got brain cancer and somebody says, Mr. Baird, just because of the age range you're in, you can't come to the hospital to be with your child as he battles cancer. How is that just? How is that consistent with progressive values? How is that in any way, shape, or form strategically smart? Congressman Wayne, could, um, do, you, do you not see any of the things Dr. Baird just described? Do, they, do you not see them? Well, let me let me just. I mean, there was there was a lot there, so let me let me let me start with a couple of things. Well, One, no, please answer my question. I mean, uh, Dr. Bird described pretty specifically various forms. I know. Of I, I, I was just about to to, yeah. to address them. Okay. You've got to let let me just answer. No, I, I'm, well, I'm, if I get if I get off track, you can reel me in, but I hadn't even started. He he. That's a, a lot of things that I do see. I do see I do see discussions and debate and votes in the Knesset in the democratically elected legislature of Israel. I do see good ideas, I see crazy ideas, but when, when, when my friend Brian Baird describes the First Amendment, it's a Jewish state. It's a Jewish state, that was it was created to be, and it's a right to have a Jewish state, just like in Egypt, there is going to be an, an Islamic state. That is... Oh, no? Oh, it's, it's not going to be? In Egypt, really? Okay. How about this? Okay. I, let me let me let me stipulate. Let me let me let me stipulate that it probably will be. Okay. 
the idea of a First Amendment, it shows a little bit of well, a blind spot. It's not going to be... It's, what do you mean by an Islamic State? I, I, I imagine that it's, it's going to be... It's going to have many of the precepts of Islam, and I'm sure there's going to be, that's going to be the, 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 the prevailing religion. Uh, it's not. I mean, you, you were there. I'd be certainly surprised if, if, the, if the, Christian, the Coptic Christians emerged as a, a Coptic Christian state. But the, but the, idea, the idea somehow that Israel is not, an, is not a Jewish state is part of the problem here. Some people believe that it shouldn't be. They, are, they have their rights, but it is, and it's going to be. Brian pointed out also that there's been a proposal by outside countries to say what they think the resolution of the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis should be. That's fine. There are a lot of ideas out there. And frankly, that's the purpose of negotiations. God, the Hamas in Gaza is not is part of any negotiations. They were, did not run on a platform of let's negotiate with Israel. It is easy to conflate what is going on in the Arab world, in the territories, and what's going on in Gaza. There are hospitals that were built in Ramallah with United States and Israeli money. When you go to Hadassah Hospital, about a third of the people there are, are non-Israeli Arabs. They are there getting care every day. You should visit. It's a remarkable to what, what's, what's going on Israeli there. Arabs the, Israeli Arabs or non-Israeli Arabs? Non-Israeli Arabs. About one-third that are in there are non-Israeli Arabs from the area because it's the best hospital around. They have the most specialized care. And, by the way, they get a lot of donations from Hadassah of the United States, as they should. So this, this idea that somehow Gaza is the same as the Arab or Palestinian world doesn't understand what's going on. There is a blockade that is legal under the Geneva Convention going on right now by the Israelis and the Egyptians against Gaza. Why? Because they're at war. I don't like that. I wish they weren't. They're at war. At times of war, you do not let in things that can be used to build to, to build bunkers, to do these other things. 15,000 tons, tons of humanitarian aid flows into Gaza each and every week. That goes in at, in compliance with the Geneva Convention. But this notion that somehow there is this, this, oh, this is this breakdown of discussions, and so they're being bombed indiscriminately, that's not happening. There's a war going on there God, that, that, that the Hamas has weighed steadily against Israel. It culminated in, in Operation Cast Lead. That's what this is about. And unfortunately, it doesn't recognize the right of self-defense of Israel. I do. How about uh, con Congress, uh, and the with, part just isn't true. with respect. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold it. Wait, right, wait, wait, Roger. OK. Yeah. This, th this is one of the problems. There are facts, and there are facts. There, it is indisputable that the Israeli administration that oversees Gaza was preventing things like lentils, tomato sauce, toothpaste, a host of other things in. And they refused repeatedly to give a list of what would get in. And fundamental basic necessities were not getting in. Now, there, there were some were getting in, much was getting in through the tunnels. But relief aid, the entire truckloads were just 15, being 15,000 tons a week, Brian. Tony, you're, you're being deceptive and you know it. That number is relative to what the need is. It is vastly beneath the need, and it does not include the necessary things to rebuild, which includes rebar. And the UN, and if uh, I know John Ging very, very rebar well. Rebar is not lentils. Rebar is not being lentils. True, fair okay, enough. But rebar is what you need. No, but, but a, re no, this a, matters, Roger, because yeah. rebar is what no, you need matter, to rebuild your schools. Yeah. Yeah to rebuild your hospitals, to rebuild your water and treatment centers. And your bunkers. Centers. Fair enough, except that if you were to channel it through UNRWA, they could get it to where it needs to go. But the fact, Tony, you cannot say that the lentil thing is not true. It is a can. statement of fact. Brian, but let me just say, first of all, I can get you the last two months worth of things that have gotten in, of which lentils were included. I get it every week, Tony. Okay, I get of it which lentils were included. From UNRWA. But you've got it, but just so we understand UNRWA, we've got to understand that part of a blockade is to keep things out of an enemy country that they can then use to fortify their bunkers to make it easier for them to launch rockets against civilian populations. That's, a, that's what happens in war. It's I get legal. That. Is it, it's legal under the Geneva Convention. We do it. We're contemplating doing it today with Libya. So this notion that somehow it's not permitted under war, it is. It's absolutely legal under the Geneva Convention. Now, you may not like what goes on during war, nor do I, which is why I hope they never happen. Here's what's not that's legal. that's the problem. Here's what's not legal under the Geneva Convention. It is not legal under the Geneva Convention to capture an area and destroy the civilian infrastructure with no 
definable security reason for doing so. You are not allowed under the Geneva Convention to do that, and if you do it, you have an obligation under the Geneva Convention, it's my understanding, to allow and to facilitate its reconstruction. And that is being blocked. I fully get that you're not gonna, but here's reality, other thing, Tony, that stuff was getting in. Rebar and concrete were getting in. It was getting in through the tunnels. This was a great big, yeah, sure, the fuel was getting in for rockets. This idea that somehow this was for security reasons only doesn't fit. When you talk to the people, there were not good explanations. The, the statement was, we don't want to starve them to death. We want to put them on a diet. That's not a security statement. With respect, Congressman Weiner, I don't think you answered my question. My question was, do any of the daily humiliations that Brian Baird described, um, as a progressive, are you troubled by the lot of the Palestinian people? Is this something that... I, I actually did answer that question. I said, yes, I, I want there to be no occupation. I want the Palestinians and Israelis to live side by side in respect and security. That's what I believe, that's what the Israeli policy is, that's what, that's what I think the overwhelming majority of the participants in the area want. Hamas does not. I want to make that clear. In their charter, they say they do not. In their actions, they say they do not. That's why negotiations are going on with Fatah and the Palestinian Authority. And that's why, by the way, the Palestinian Authority is basically at war with Hamas also. You know? And that's why, by the way, you can see a difference in the development in the West Bank with 11% year-over-year growth, with no Israeli occupation there either, which increasingly, with increasing access to checkpoints. All right, let's, here's, here's, what, here's what maybe area, we should. What about areas C, hold, D, and E? Hold on, let's, let, hold on, maybe, maybe this would be helpful. No occupation in the West Bank? Let me, thing? let me, yeah. I'm sorry, did I hear you right? Yes. I'm sorry, uh, have you, you been just, to the West Bank Yes. Recently? You didn't see the IDF there? I, 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 in Ramallah? No. In that, Nablus? Ramallah no. Ramallah the West Bank. In, so in, 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 now, now. Now, can I tell you, there, there might be some people in this room who believe that Jerusalem is occupied territory. Now, hang on a second. Let's stick with the West Bank. I mean, they probably are. Stick, you're saying that there is no IDF presence in the West Bank? Yes. <laughs> I don't... I, 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 I'm... I'm amazed. What, the che checkpoint? I'm amazed che you would say that. Che are you aware of areas C, D, checkpoints, and E? Checkpoints Jordan that Valley. are being Jordan Valley, any Israeli troops in the Jordan Valley? Well, at, at checkpoints, yes. If there's no, uh, but Tony, I mean, wait, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you not, are you, are you to go ahead to tell me what you, 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 you think that there are Israeli troops uh, uh, that are still, that are still in places like Ramallah? We're not, I'm They're not. The West Bank. Are, are there or are they not? Yes, there are. There on are a rate, yeah, absolutely. No, on Ramallah a rate, no, no, area, no, 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 but wait. Is, Ramallah, area C, D, and E of the West Bank, uh, there are Israeli troops throughout those areas, and there are, Often patrols there, that come there, Well, look, there is a, there's a security fence that separates the two of them. Separates which two? That separate, that, that separate, that a security fence that separates the Palestinian side from the Israeli that side. That is correct, built by Israel. Right. But so on, on the a, other on side a, of that fence, the IDF is very much present, I think. But on, on which side of the fence? On the Palestinian side. Okay. On a regular basis, is IDF forces come into areas controlled by the Palestinians, policed by the Palestinians, and without pal author approval of the Palestinian Authority, pick up Palestinians. They arrest kids, they arrest civilians, they arrest, uh, they, they do this all the time. And I will tell you, it, profoundly. That's, that's, no, that's not true, Brian. That's not true. Now, now, every time an IDF officer goes, on the, go, goes and does one of those, it is with a Palestinian Authority officer. Is that is part of the most recent agreement. Tony, Tony I've got to tell you, I've, I was there just last October. I met with the Palestinian leadership. I met with people in the field. What, it's amazing to me that, that people say things, you know, the lentil story is not true. People and and Gaza is the occupied. Idea. There's no idea. Yeah. And Gaza is occupied. I mean, it is you, a statement of fact, Tony, that, that Gaza is occupied. No, it is a statement of fact that this idea the, forces go in to the Palestinian areas. It is a huge undermining of the Palestinian Authority. We've worked so hard with Dayton to train the Palestinian police, and then the IDF comes in and pinches the Palestinians. And it is a huge undermining of the integrity and the independence and the sovereignty of the Palestinians. And is Gaza it's, occupied? Okay, can we, can we get, let's, let, excuse me, if I, if I may. We, is, we, let, me, let me just clear yeah, this up. Sure. Is Gaza occupied, Brian? I think it absolutely is. Okay. So right now there are, there are, there are Israelis in Gaza. No, but, but there are U.S. Okay. made so F-16s and, and U.S. made weaponry and a host of other folks. But not in Gaza. On any day, on any given day, Israelis can enter Gaza. Yes, at any time they can enter them, but they are not in Gaza today. I don't know that. They don't I occupy to... Gaza today. 
if the Goldstone Report characterized Gaza as still being occupied. Tony, if somebody built a wall around your house. <laughs> Go ahead. And said, Tony, Tony, you can't leave your house. A blockade. You can't Let's come call it in what it or is, go. An international blockade. Okay, so we can play with semantics. Let me ask you this no, question. No, that's the, what's what right, it is. So, so that'd blockade. be okay if I do this tonight. I show up at Tony's house with a bunch of blast walls, put them around you, and say, "If we were at war, no, we're not. I mean, you're, no, if we, yeah, no, you can't say. Occupied. No, hold on a second. This is the problem, Brian. You're talking as if, of course, that's a terrible place to be, with a wall around you. But if we were at war. If we're at war, if Gaza, if, if Hamas was at a declared state of war with Israel and there was a legal blockade by Egypt and Israel to, as part of that war, yes, I would not like it, but I would not also not, not like being at war. But Tony, now you've got a problem because the wall is not just around Gaza. The wall is around countless villages in the West Bank as well. There, it is around Bethlehem, the holy city. It is around countless Palestinian cities where they have come in long since the second Intifada bombings, which were horrific, but long since those stopped, the wall is still going up. They're not at war, at any official war that I know of, with the communities on the West Bank. So where's the justification? Well, what? All right. Well, we, the, the the justification for the security fence, the justification for the security fence is that we're people not talking were talking about that. I think. Yes, I, no, that's what Brian was talking no, about. No, no, I'm no, talking no, about the encirclement. You're you're arguing that the defense. You, you said of the, the IDF was out of the West Bank, Congressman. Which no, no, I, no. I think this, you'll find is Brian, true. Uh, Brian, Brian just asked about the security fence. Can I respond to his question? Sure. The security fence. Why is it still there? It's there because it was effective. It's expanding. In the exterior security fence is there because it was effective and continues to be. Unfortunately, this was the only thing that turned out to be effective in stopping bombers from coming from the Palestinian territories, coming into cafes and restaurants and discotheques in Israel and blowing themselves up. It worked. It's regrettable that it did. It's regrettable that it was necessary, but the facts are the facts. Since it's been built, those attacks, thank God, have reduced to practically zero. So you justify, though, you justified the wall around Gaza on the basis that they're at war, does that mean that the walls in the West Bank are justified or that the Israel's at war with the Palestinian Authority Well, there's not the actually a war. The, the, the Gaza blockade, I've explained now four times, and I could do it again. It's legal I'm under... I'm talking West Bank here. Let's oh, move oh, to the West I, Bank. Oh, no, yeah, you you, 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 you just like juxtaposed the two things. It's a security side. fence that, that is defensive in nature and has been effective. Unfortunately, it, it, it has been. Congressman, I would just remark, if I may, as moderator, that you, you mentioned the, ten, the very strong economic growth in the West Bank, and this, as you know, has been led by the efforts of Prime Minister Salam Fayyad. And I think you'll find, if you check, that one of the things the Prime Minister is, is asking for all the time is that Israel withdraw from more areas of the West Bank so that he is able to continue and grow his economic and institution building program. And he is deeply frustrated, I think you will find, because uh, the IDF has not done this. So I would urge you to well, check, also, your, check your yeah, contention that the I, IDF I, I, let me, is, let me, no longer on, on, is no longer in the West Bank. Well, let me, let, me, let, me, let me tell you about my conversation with Fayyad. He was, the last time I met with him, was bragging on the idea that increasingly the amount of cooperation between the Israeli security forces and the Palestinian security forces, both in terms of training and going out and getting bad guys before they were able to do things, was one of the things he was most proud of. That he said that now the relationship is so good that they coordinate these activities together. Now there is disagreement. There are people who believe that settlement activity is going on in, in Palestinian territories. There are people who believe that. I don't believe that. But the, the Israeli government itself has said that it is pursuing, since it lifted the moratorium, that settlement, settlement growth continues. Uh, it said it itself. Are you disputing what the Israeli government said? The settlement growth continuing is not what I just said. I said I don't believe that, that it's going on in Palestinian territories. Where do you think? It's going on in Israel. So Israel, is, Israel includes the West Bank. It's... It is, it is going on the, where the, the, the ultimately settlements there were going to have to be land swaps or whatever as part of a final settlement. However, that would be part of the negotiated settlement between the parties there. I mean, th this, so the where whole do you, question... Where do you think the settlement growth is happening right now? If it's not, where do you think it's happening? What do you mean, where do I think it's happening? Well, you just said it's, you just said it's happening in Israel. Where, where, yes. where in Israel? I don't follow your question. <laughs> what do you mean, where I, it's happening? Where is the settlement? It's a matter where, of fact where the settlement's happening. I don't, I don't understand your question. Well, I'm asking you whether you said it's in Israel. It as is. far as I know, the settlement growth is in the West Bank. I believe I believe it is in it is in Israel. 
Tony, okay. Tony, are you saying that wherever there's a settlement, it's by definition Israel? Am I saying that? Yes, uh, I am saying that at some, at, at some point, and it's not going to be the three of us, but at some point, Palestinians and Israelis are going to negotiate at some point where development is going to be able to happen, who's where the border exists. Right now, the settlement that's going on is going on in Israel. That's not a terribly, con that's not a controversial thing to say. I mean, that's a matter of fact. You may want in the future where Israeli homes are to say these are Palestinian side of the border, but that's not the case yet. Uh, Congressman, where for you is the border of Israel? Where is the border? Uh, how, 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 do you, how do you want me? Do you want me to describe it on a map? Well, I don't know. Where is it? Uh, how, 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 Mr. Moderator of this debate, how would you like me to describe well, it? How do, you, how, do, how do you want me to do that? One border is the sea, and where is the eastern border? The Jordan River. Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn to a few questions. Where's the northern border? Where's the northern yeah, I'm asking you, where's the northern border? The northern border is with Lebanon. Yeah, well, where, where does that border exist? Because you know the United Nations has said where the border is, and it's continually encroached upon, and never, that's never enforced. You never see a, a, a UN resolution on that. You never see any effort a part of the UN to enforce the, 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 the northern border, which is continually encroached upon. Uh, I have a, I need to, I would like to ask. Error on fire! Which one? Please, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a couple of questions here. Uh, w one is to you, Congressman. Uh, would you be willing to visit Gaza to see the situation with your own eyes? Uh, I, I, I asked to the last time I was there, I was told it would, I wouldn't be safe there. And that, I, I, I suspect, based on these comments today, they're probably right, I wouldn't be. Why do you think Congressman Baird was safe? I think because he serves a useful purpose for them. Uh, could I ask you to respond to that, Congressman Baird? That's, it's possible that, 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 that it's possible that people make a calculated decision about who gets in or out, but uh, it's also, it's, I, will, I will tell you that my, my, my own calculation and that of Keith Ellison were that we were going into a war zone. We chose no security. I mean, we didn't want some guy with a bug in the ear and all that nonsense for two reasons. Most importantly, we didn't want to get somebody to get between with us and the Palestinians. I mean, we literally, Keith and I, would stop the car and just get out and talk to people. I mean, we'd literally say, can we stop here and talk to the storekeeper? Yeah. We'd get out and talk to him. <coughs> so we didn't want somebody intervening. Secondly, to be perfectly honest, somebody wants to kill us and we're there, they're going to kill us. I mean, you know, I've been in Iraq and I've been escorted by these massive artillery or, or armored convoys and I get it. They could still probably take you out there if they want, but we couldn't go into, obviously, Gaza with that. But I felt it was important. I felt it was important to see what was going on, just as I felt it was important to go to Starot, just as I felt it was important to go to Ramallah, just as I felt it was important to go to other Israeli communities and to try to find areas where Palestinians, Israelis, and other Arabs are getting along because those places also exist. Neva Shalom, Wahad al-Salam, and other places like that. But, it, you know, I'm cognizant when I go into a place that there are political ramifications of going in. But I'm also cognizant that there are political ramifications of not going in. And that we have, a, I felt we had a moral responsibility to see what was actually happening on the ground and to go repeatedly to do that. And uh, I, I think there might be a higher risk for Tony. I really do. And, and I wouldn't want him necessarily to run that risk. Why do you think he would run a higher risk? Well, I mean, he's Jewish. First of all, I'm not. He's a, he's a, he, you've heard his statements. We're, we differ on that. But I will tell you there's a compromise. So are you saying that I shouldn't go to Gaza? No, or? I think you, oh, you know, oh, I'm not. Oh. No. You, you. no but, but let me say there's a compromise, and I'll tell you an interesting story. So Keith and I came out of Gaza right after Cass led, and we asked the then brand new uh, uh, U.S. ambassador if he would go to Gaza. Mm -hmm. And he was concerned about his safety. Now, look, he's the ambassador. He's got to run some risks. I had just been there. What, my wife and kids, they don't matter if they kill me? But then we said, well, what about this? Why don't you bring some of the people we met with in Gaza out to see you here? 
the U.S. trained business people, the mental health professionals, the physicians, the relief workers, the civilians, the business owners. Why don't you invite them to come? The answer was really telling. I don't know if the Israelis would let them. I said, oh, I, you know, I think this country that receives millions of U.S. dollars a day, if we ask them really nicely, might let you talk to some folks to hear what happened. You don't have to go in yourself to learn about this. You can, you can, when I used to be in Congress, you could look on my website and see the interviews with the people in the field, the raw footage of talking to the, the, the people on the ground about what they'd been through. There are ways to find out what's going Roger, on. Roger, uh, yes. can I talk a little bit about what I observed in Sterot? Um, but let, let me ask this question. Isn't, isn't, that, to, isn't that, that fair? I mean, you've talked a great deal about what was observed on the Gaza well, I, I, side of this conflict. Can I talk a little bit about the well, effect a, of the 12,000? Here's a question to you that well, relates to Sirot. So can I ask this? Or did, okay, well, I've got a hundred questions here, and if I don't start no, asking. No, I understand. It just seems now you've asked three times Brian to talk about his observations there. I've been to I've been to okay, Sterot. I've been to Sterot as well, and okay, I think but, it's but worth let me, let, Why don't you do Gaza, I'll do Sterot. This relates to Let's get a little balance. I'm going to ask this question. And this is from the audience, Congressman Weiner. Were Hamas to alert the residents of Sderot of when and where it intends to rocket them, would these attacks then be legal and morally justifiable in your view? No. No, because the, because the, the attacks, the repeated 12,000 attacks, and that's how many there were. And I want you to try to envision what you would expect our response to be as a city or as a country if our town was under attack repeatedly, not one or two random things, as an act of the policy of our neighboring government. Let's call it New Jersey. They decided we were going to lob in thousands of, of, of rockets, randomly fire, because these don't have much guidance. They're basically fairly inexpensive things. They're just supposed to randomly go into a, to a populated place where there are schools, where there are children. 12,000 of them. And Would it be George after, George here, let me, if, 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 I, if, if, if I could, Mr. Moderator, let me just finish my thought. It, would we say, would I ask this audience, would you say, okay, let's wait till there are 50 before we do anything. Maybe we'll wait till there's 100. Maybe we'll wait till there's 1,000. Imagine 1,000 of them falling in your neighborhood. Imagine the sirens going off 1,000. At what point, at what point, at what point does it become an appropriate response to say, I'm warning you, if you don't stop that, I am going to use my military to force you to stop it. And I am going to make you stop by, an act, by a responsive act of war. Is it so, I ask you to put yourself in the place of the president or mayor or governor of that response. Now, you may not, you may say to yourself, well, you know what? It's, it's, once you warn them and once you do flyers and once you do leaflets and it gets to 11,000 and then 12,000, you should still wait before you do anything to respond. And then you get a report like this that talks about the damage. Yes, yes, there were, it was terrible. It was a terrible, damaging war. But it was initiated by Hamas after 12,000 rockets. It is the right of a, of a people to defend themselves and you would not know that reading the Goldstone Report. Um, I Roger, let me, let me talk just a little about Starot, just, just very briefly. Okay, it sure. is absolutely unacceptable what the people of Starot have had to go through. Absolutely unacceptable. And nobody should get, try to get put in a position of saying, well, I'm going to somehow justify one side rocketing enough. It's unacceptable. It truly is. You need to, to, to understand that I feel that way very strongly. Nobody should send their kids to school worrying about whether a rocket's going to hit their kids. Nobody. Nobody. But part of what Goldstone tries to do, and actually to get back to the report itself, Goldstone tries to, to, to make these distinctions, to make the distinctions about what is a legitimate response. And it is relevant to tie in the rest of the Palestinian experience, just as none of us would sit by passively and tolerate any neighbor shooting rockets into our neighborhood. Neither would we tolerate the confiscation of our land. Neither would we confiscate the encirclement of our communities and people telling our kids, no, you can't go to school, you can't get to hospital, you can't get to work, unless we decide you can. We would not tolerate that either. And on the one hand, it's unacceptable to launch 
completely unguided missiles. I mean, these are, there are some sophisticated weapons, and it's a horrible thing to get hit by them, but much of these are homemade model rocketry jobs that land in the dirt. That's a different thing than an F-16 coming in with a JDAM on your school or your hospital or a white phosphorus bomb. These are qualitatively different things. And I will tell you, as bad as it must be for the people of Starot, there are many people of Starot who are trying to reach out to the Gazans and say, you know, for many years we worked together, we dined together, we recreated together, let's try to rebuild that. And if you cross the line between the verdant, modern, developed, <coughs> free, free area of Starod and Ashkelon and go through Eretz Crossing into the devastated, barren, encircled and imprisoned area of Gaza, there is a big difference and it's a qualitative and quantitative difference. You write something very powerful here, uh, Brian, when you say, I look at my colleagues and say, this refers back to the situation you were describing where a, f a father can't get to his son who's dying of cancer. I look at my colleagues and say, you know, I will tell you what happens to me if my child dies of cancer and I can't be with him. I'm a terrorist after that point. Are you a moderator? Yeah. I'm just, yes, I, I'm trying to be a moderator, yeah. Um, that, that, well, that, I take that as high praise, sir. Thank you. Uh, um, it's a question to you, um, Dr. Baird. If, if Israel's operation in Gaza constitutes a war crime, how else do you suggest Israel defend itself against Hamas that says in its charter that its aim is to destroy the state of Israel? Absolutely fair question. Uh, First of all, it's worth noting something that does get addressed in Goldstone, and, and I'm happy to see in some of the commentaries. It is not that there was an incessant, nonstop, unrelenting barrage of rockets and mortars from Gaza. In fact, there had been periods of relative quiescence. In fact, not long before Cass led, <coughs> as truths, truces that were negotiated held. In fact, the Israeli government used to post the numbers of rockets coming in, and when those dropped down to virtually nil, they took that off the website. If you follow the counterinsurgency strategy of Petraeus and others, one of the starting points for dealing with an insurgency is understanding why it exists. You don't have to justify it, you don't have to defend it, you don't have to excuse it, but you do have to ask yourself, why is this happening? Why are we getting rocketed? Why are we having this conflict? And I would suggest first, first thing you would do is try to say, let's try to understand the difference. And it's my belief in, in, in both sides, frankly, both sides of this conflict. There are lots of reasonable people who can work together. And frankly, there are some nut jobs on both sides. There are people who believe it is their God-given right to have the other guys land. On both sides, they believe that. If they win, everybody loses. You've got to try to find a way to not let them guide your governance on either side. And by the way, Hamas was elected. It is true that Hamas, first of all, Hamas was elected. Okay, that's a worthwhile statement right there. But secondly, it is true that it is part of their platform that they're in conflict with Israel. But ask the people of Gaza, why'd you vote for Hamas? And they'll say, because PA was corrupt. They are not saying, by and large, and I have asked them, by and large, they're not saying because we want an Islamic government. They're not saying because we want to be at war with Israel. By and large, that's not what they're saying. We were sick and tired of the corruption of the PLO. That's what they're going to tell you. That's what they'll say. Now, many of them, many today, will say we are vehemently opposed to the religious ideology of Hamas, but they're fighting back. And I would suggest to us strategically that we have inadvertently empowered Iran and other extremist groups because the people who oppose the oppression of the Palestinian people in that region see that at least Hamas, I'm not defending this, but that's what they'll tell you, at least Hamas is fighting back and at least Iran is helping them fight back. So if you're really worried about Iran, you ought to try to solve this in a different way. And I think we've actually 
played right into the hands of the extremists uh, through these policies. <coughs> there's, there's another question to you here, Dr. Baird, which is um, before you ever went to Gaza, did you have any bias uh, in favor or against Israel, Palestine, or were you, did you feel you were neutral when you went in? Well, I, I have long been a supporter of Israel. I have many friends. I went over to Israel as one of my, maybe my first international visit after being elected. I went on an AIPAC trip. Uh, and I admire greatly much about Israel. I want to be really clear about this. One of the unfortunate things is if someone reads Goldstone and, and believes it's an accurate portrayal, that then can easily be branded as, ironically, Goldstone himself was branded an anti-Semite. That's not true. It is possible to criticize your own country, which I do often, and Israel, which I do when it's justified, and not be anti-Semitic or anti-Israeli. In fact, if you don't have somebody who cares about you giving you honest feedback, you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. I had a growing concern about conduct of Israel. One of my constituents was run over by an Israeli bulldozer, Rachel Corey. And I was not satisfied with how the Israeli government handled that. I can tell you, I was not at all satisfied. And the Israel I saw when I first went in 1999 and the West Bank I saw in 1999 are different places today. The amount of expansion of the wall, the settlement activity, what happened in Gaza, the numbers of people imprisoned, etc. things changed. And I understand the history of the change. We could go for length. But no, I tried. I was distraught about what had happened to those kids. But I will tell you, when I got into Gaza, it was worse. When you go to a hospital that's been bombed with white phosphorus, a hospital. When you go to a school that said, Lady, when you go to a school, this is amazing, actually. To get, to get heckled when I talk about a bombed hospital is really not a credit, credit to you or to any nation you support. Yeah, but here's the point. But this, I, I, I don't want to. But the, I, I, I don't want to encourage anyone, anyone to shout out, and, and no one should. But the idea that Goldstone completely dismissed the idea that Palestinians were that, that in Gaza and members of Hamas were storing their armaments close to population centers, were using were using human shields, is an important part of this discussion that Goldstone completely glosses over. And he says why he didn't because they told us they didn't. That was, their, that was his explanation in the Goldstone Report. We received testimony from many members who, who said, oh no, I didn't see this. Now, never mind the fact these people were testifying openly, often on television, and so to expect them to, uh, to testify honestly about the activities of Hamas is completely glossed over. The fact is about the Goldstone Report, getting us back to, to where we began this, the problem is that, yes, justifiable criticism fair criticism, a balanced report, and a balanced forum, I don't think anyone, anyone would say that there's a problem with. Goldstone was not that. And what it does do is undermine people who want to take shots at Israel because all you have to do is look at this report, see the conditions that operated, look at the United Nations, 26 of 34 of their motions for the Human Rights Commission, which Libby got kicked off of yesterday. Okay, that's what the agency is that was doing this investigation. But that's not Judge Goldstone. Simply, I understand, but it, you know, you, you cannot say that Libby's this has credibility. Earth. That doesn't you mean we're say, bad because we're on the same No, planet. you can't say this has credibility when that's where it comes from. There's well, a reason a, why it has no credibility. You can look at the place it comes from and say, you know what, it simply lacks the credibility. And I think that's what the gentleman it, was pointing out, that you can't the just The gentleman look, was pointing out. Yeah, the, when, he was saying, <laughs> when, he was, when he was saying that you can, can't just look at the bombing that took place in the abstract and say, yes, it's a bad thing to bomb any place. Well, I just thought of no, it's not a bad thing to bomb Why, why do you think sure. an internationally respected judge with, from everything I understand, a deep love of Israel would go out of his way to write a report in the way that you describe it? Well, I don't know. No Western, no Western government endorsed this. No Western uh, country supported it at the United Nations. It has, frankly, been, except for this, for this form, it hasn't gotten a great deal of, of respect because of the fact that it wasn't very well balanced. 
It was dismissed overwhelmingly by the United States. The President Obama went to visit Sterot and said, when he visited there, he said, if I had two children who were living in a town that was bombed 10,000 times, I would say to my government, do anything you can to protect them. The President of the United States, who I've, been, who I've had very problems with, the way he's dealt with Israel, I think, don't think he's been as tough as he should. He said that this, this report does, isn't worth the paper it's written on. So it is not just me. It's the, almost the, the, the entire community of the international community, except for countries like Libya, China, and these others that sit on this Human Rights Commission. It has no credibility because of the place it came from. No, no, no. And also it has no credibility for another reason. If you read it, as I've said before, it takes facts that are in evidence and draws a, a motivation to them that is not supported. That leap, which is the important one, it is not whether there was destruction. Brian saw a lot of destruction. You can take pictures of the destruction. That's not the issue. The issue is whether or not this was somehow outside the reasonable bounds of what happens in an unreasonable moment, which is war. In the few minutes we have left, I'd, I'd just like um, to, to just step back a little bit, we are meeting at a hopeful moment of great change in the Middle East, which, which I've just witnessed, <coughs> in which Arabs are, peoples are putting their lives on the line to try and get, get rid of dictators who've been in place 40, 30, 20 plus years. Um, and Congressman, you've spoken glowingly of Israel's vital and vibrant democracy and, and, and its freedoms. Um, how do you think Israel should respond to this quest among its neighbors to become democracies themselves? It, do you think it should be supportive or suspicious? It should all? be supportive, and it has been. You know, you, you plucked one quote of, that said you've got to be careful. You don't know which is what a lot of commentators have said. No one knows what's really going to happen. But overwhelmingly, I think that they've struck the right tone, which is to say that what people in Egypt are protesting for, and as, as I've said in several interviews, you know, it's the first protest in the Middle East I've seen in 15 years, as you pointed out, that it didn't say death to Israel or death to the United States. It was for all these things that the United States and Israel feel in, in our bones, the idea of aspiration, living up to their ideals. It can only be a good thing. Now, I will say this. You know, we were taught in school that no two democracies had ever gone to war with one another. Well, that's not true anymore, because Brian's right. There is a democracy that, was, that took hold in West Bank and Gaza. They voted for Hamas. They voted in large numbers for Hezbollah in Lebanon. So now it's no longer true that no two democracies have ever been at war. Now there are democracies at war. I believe the first instinct of people when they get the right to vote is to gravitate towards their team, their neighborhood guy. I think over the course of time, democracy ultimately leads people to say, I don't want to fight with my neighbors anymore. I'm more concerned about getting an improved quality of life, and I think it moves us towards a better place. That's what is going to happen. And God willing, in the years to come, you're going to have more countries that look more like Israel than look like Egypt, that look like Lebanon, that look like Syria, that look like Saudi Arabia. Think of these countries. You, you... We want more countries that look like Israel in the Middle East and in the world. That's the bottom line. What do you think Israel could do? What do you think Israel could or should do at this moment to further that aim? Well, here's what, here, what they're doing so far, in my understanding, is exactly what they should do. They're keeping open lines of communication, military to military, because, frankly, many of the Egyptian military were trained here in the United States. They've got United States armaments, despite my best efforts. In 2004, I think, I think uh, I'm, uh, 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 Brian might have even voted for this, I offered amendments saying we shouldn't give military armaments to Egypt. It should be entirely humanitarian and economic. We should comply with Camp David and give equal amounts to Israel and, the, and, and, and Egypt. But it, arming them was a bad idea. And having tear gas canisters rolling through the streets of Egypt with Made in the USA on them, I think, was bad for us. But I do think that Israel is doing the right thing of trying to keep up this line of communications with the e Egyptian military, because the last thing we want is the Egyptian military to feel, to kind of fall under the wrong influence. Um, but I, I think what's going on in Egypt, what's going on in Libya, ultimately, while it might have some growing pains, is the ideals that I and I think all of us should want, which are people getting to live up to their aspirations. And I just want to return to one other thing. It was not to be dismissive the idea that you have an Islamic country. 
There's nothing inherently wrong with that. Saudi Arabia, there are Islamic countries throughout the region th that we should not allow the far right to capture the idea that somehow practicing a religion makes you necessarily sinister. That is not the case. The point that I was making is just that Israel has a right to be in a, in a, a Jewish state. Other countries have right to be Islamic states. But the point I was making was not about whether or not Israel can consider itself a Jewish state. The point I was making was whether they have a right to imprison people who disagree with that. And when I'm speaking of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of the speech or the press or the right of the peace people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. That does not apply throughout parts of Israel to Palestinians. At its best, I 100% agree with Anthony. At its best, we want a lot of Israels in the region with free press, vibrant, open discussion, respect for the rights of women, religious pluralism. At its very, very best, we want that. I want it. It's why I consider myself to this day a supporter of Israel, and it's why I'm here. But in some areas, it hasn't lived up to its best. And to make, to say, well, Libya wanted this, therefore, Judge Goldstone, for goodness sakes. Judge Goldstone, you know this man's history. To dismiss him in this way is a discredit to international justice and to his distinguished record. The, 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 the report was, the report was. But by the way, I just want to make it clear, there's no country in the world that has the First Amendment but us. And when we speak of democracy, we don't do us a service. I don't, Jefferson didn't want a democracy. Madison didn't want a democracy. You don't live in a democracy. You live in a constitutional democratic republic. And thankfully so. Because without it, you get mob rule. And if these other countries, if we advocate democracy without merit and without constitutional protections for basic rights, including rights of minorities and women and religious minorities and freedom of speech, we're making a hell of a mistake. Uh, I'll just close on this question. Uh, President Obama has, has committed to welcoming a new state in September to the United Nations family, a Palestinian state living in peace and security beside Israel. Uh, Congressman Weiner, what do you think the United States, that's six months from now, uh, what do you think the United States should do to achieve that aim? Well, we have to first and foremost respect our fellow democracy. They have citizens that have a chance to vote, to vote a government in and frequently vote them out. Invariably, when Israeli governments are voted out, they're voted out because they don't do enough to pursue peace, not the other way around. So ultimately, we have to respect the rights of a sovereign democracy, respect the rights to defend themselves, to govern themselves, to do what's right. They are not a 51st state of the United States. We mustn't treat them like one. We should do everything we can to say to the parties there, Palestinian and Israeli, we stand as the beacon of democracy in the world to do anything we can to facilitate that. You want to have a meeting in the Rose Garden? We'll do it. Even if you want aid from us as part of the thing, one of the first things, and I'm, you know, I'm a proud Zionist who's been very critical of the Palestinians, one of the first votes I cast for foreign aid was to actually provide aid as part of Y River to the Palestinians because that was part of what was negotiated and what was asked of us as part of helping facilitate peace. We cannot dictate to them where they build in their country, how they build in their country, or the resolution to this dispute. That must be negotiated peacefully between the parties, which is why Mahmoud Abbas has to return to the negotiating table immediately, where Bibi Netanyahu is sitting and waiting as he has been for four months. Uh, Dr. Bad, could, would, you, would you address that question, please? What should we, the United States, be doing right now to resolve this conflict at this moment of hope and change in the Middle East? How do we seize on this and take it further? Well, first thing we ought to do is, is enact what we've actually established as, as U.S. foreign policy for a long time, which is settlements don't expand. In fact, U.S. legal decisions have said they're illegal. 
And so when the President of the United States says you have to stop the settlement expansion. But then he just vetoed. Uh, I, I'm well, what did you think of the veto? I thought it was, it was a missed opportunity. I what did you think of the veto of? Uh, yeah. I don't believe the United Nations is where you negotiate between two parties. That's not the way it's done. The United Nations exists to beat the bejesus out of Israel at every opportunity. It is not a fair player. The Palestinians and Israelis should be negotiating borders, not Barack Obama and not, uh, and, and, and not the United Nations. Roger, yeah. now, now I'll answer yeah. your question. Okay. Thank and you, Tony. We'll <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, it, the, the, the issue here is when we are inconsistent with core values, when we are seen as not respecting rights of all people, we act in ways that are detrimental to U.S. national interests. And I will tell you, one of the most troubling things about this whole process, profoundly troubling to me, I take an up oath to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That should be my priority. That should be my priority. And when we stray from adherence to our deeper virtues, our integrity, our responsibility, our fundamental respect for human rights, we jeopardize our national security. And I think we have to insist, I'm deeply troubled by what seems to be an argument that anywhere there's an Israeli citizen is de facto Israel. And there are people in Israel, including members of the, of the coalition government in power there, that believe indeed Israel goes to the West Bank. If so, and this isn't Brian Baird talking, this is Ehud Barak, if so, you're going to get apartheid. And if you want apartheid, if you think that's a sustainable sustainable, secure mechanism, you're just wrong. It's, sustainable. it's not sustainable for a couple of reasons. The international community won't tolerate it because the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. It is not sustainable because of demographics, for goodness sakes. And if you think that's going to work, it is not. And I think, Roger, back to, to Goldstone and then, and then to your observation about what's happening in the region. When we condemn a report as a, as a government body that people haven't read about a place they haven't been without asking the author of the report to at least come and explain himself. We do a disservice to justice and truth. And if we do that, we will lose a lot of friends in the region. And this hopeful renaissance, let's hope it is a renaissance of the Arab world, faces enormous challenges. The, the demographics of that region right now are horrifying. You know it better than me. The numbers of young people who are going to have high expectations and high hopes at a time of grave inter, uh, international economic uh, uh, challenges, we better find a way to get everybody working together. And every penny spent on these armaments on both sides are not putting people to work except in, in very unproductive capacities. Thank you. Did you want to add? Uh, well, I just want to add in, in, I mean, I agree with a great deal of what Brian said, except the difference that I think Brian and I have, and I certainly have it with the Goldstone Report, is that it is ultimately going to come down to a resolution between the parties in that part of the world where the line is going to be drawn, and that's a matter of geography, and I think it's soluble, and we know that they've been very close on a couple of occasions and a very close not too distant past, and assured security on both sides. That second piece is the part that Goldstone ignores, and the second piece, with all due respect to my friend Brian, Brian ignores. This is not simply a question of whether or not the 67 borders, or you go to some other borders. This is a question of how you deal with the fact that there is an element in that part of the world, and Brian stipulated to this to his credit, who simply wants to do harm and doesn't want Israel to exist. I don't saying it's everyone, I'm not saying that there hasn't been progress since 1948 and to, 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 to get to, to where more and more people maybe in the region accept that Israel exists. Hamas is not among them. The people that rain 12,000 rockets down upon Starod are not among them. The people in, they, even, the people in the Palestinian Authority, I believe, are. And I believe that ultimately if those parties sit down and negotiate that this is a solvable problem. I don't believe it's insoluble. But in answer to, to, the, to the big question, what should we do? We've got to respect that both parties have to resolve this at the negotiating table. If you get to the point that you're doing Goldstone 2, it's a failure. There's no doubt about it. 
You don't want to have that type of a breakdown. And my view is that ultimately we have an ally in that part of the world that we should support, not unquestioningly, you should always question, but they are a democracy. And they do have an ability, both sides, to have these negotiations. And what we should all be calling for is for both sides to sit down and negotiate in earnest these difficult things. I believe we can do it. I believe the moment in our, in our, in our world's civic life is such that this is a propitious time to do it. And I hope, God hope, that we, that, we, that we do that. But I thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I just say one thing in conclusion, which is uh, I'm a naturalized American. I have strong feelings about this country, and I think America is at its best when its values and its interests are aligned. And it's been a big problem uh, for the United <coughs> States, in my view, to find itself in a position of backing people like Ben Ali in Tunisia, like Mubarak in Egypt, um, dictators. Um, and it's been very easy for the likes of Iran to say, you see, the United States talks about democracy, but look at the reality. So I think there is a historic opportunity right now to get our values and our interests better aligned. And there's no stronger way to reinforce that, in my view, than to seize this opportunity to move toward peace at last between Israel and Palestine. Because as long as that conflict is festering, the potential for further radicalization always exists in the area. Thank you.